I watch a video real quick. Hello, everyone. Hope you guys are doing well. Thanks for joining us today. Um, to the Partners in Development Coaches Collaborative, uh, we have a very, very special guest on today. Dr. Arturo Hernandez from the University of Houston. Um, I'm going to pass it over to Tom because Dr. Hernandez and Tom have been speaking a lot lately, and there's some really interesting things that are going on with uh, with a book that he's writing currently, and uh, and a really cool story behind it. So I'll pass it on over to Tom. Okay, thank you, Paul, um, and. Good, uh, I guess, good morning for everybody there. This is Tom Beyer coming to you as usual from my home in Tokyo, Japan, where it's uh, one o'clock in the morning. So we do have an incredible special guest. I have not, never been more excited than, uh, than to hear this today. Um, and just a little bit of background, um, Dr. Arturo Hernandez, who is a professor of psychology at the University of Houston, where he has published over 60 different journal articles. Um, I mean, he has been awarded just about everything you can imagine, multiple awards, including the Willem Bessel Research Award from the Humboldt, I can't pronounce these well, Foundation in Germany and a Fulbright Global Scholar Award. And the expertise that he is gonna talk about today is, is just something that both Paul and I um, have been so interested in is, is at, from at least a soccer coach's perspective and the title, as it says, The Emergence of Skill. Now, Dr. Hernandez is, is, is a specialist in studying languages and how we are, human beings acquire um, the ability uh, to speak not just one language, but just multiple languages. So he's really an expert, um, and he's going to talk about how we acquire both uh, uh, me mental skills, language, and physical skills, and how that applies to, to soccer in specific. But I'm, I'm probably the fortunate one because I'm the only one that's going to be in this presentation today who's actually read his book already, The Emergence of Skill, that's going to be published. And all I can say is that this book is such a game changer um, of all of his work and life experiences that he's brought together inside this book. I am so excited about this book coming out, and he'll tell you a little bit more about that. So I will shut up. And I will pass the mic to Dr. Hernandez um, and take it away. Good luck. All right. Thanks so much for that introduction. Wow. I, I think I should just leave right now and feel good the rest of the day, but I'll <laughs> stay with you guys a little bit longer. Um, thanks so much. And, and I'll tell you a little bit about um, sort of how I'm pitching, my, pinching myself right now because I reached out to Tom to, to ask if he could, you know, I had read his stuff and, and I reached out to him and then he introduced me to Paul and now we've been talking and, and so now I'm here. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about how that began um, in, in, in a little bit later in the talk, but, but I wanted to tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, let's see, hold on a second. Yeah, so so this is my language uh, stuff, and I'll have a and I'll have a cup. I'll have a one slide pretty much on language, and then after that we'll get back we'll get back to skills, and I'll, and I'll make a segue here to to make it clearer for people. But I have this very interesting. So I made this figure of my language experience. So it turns out that I grew up simultaneous Spanish English bilingual. So Spanish was my mother tongue, right? Home language, English at school. Um, and, and I spent a lot of time in Mexico in my childhood. And an interesting thing about this experience was that at age about three or so, my, my mom chose to put me in home care um, with a lady who was from Iran. And so she spoke to me in Farsi for a year. 
Um, and my mom claims that I would talk back to her in Farsi. I don't speak Farsi today. Like I, it's gone. It's a lost language. I never spoke it again. Um, so it's very interesting to me think about, well, what was the effect of this really early experience that I just have never had again on the rest of my language, right? There's just, there's kind of like this, this gap in there, you know, what's left in there from that really early experience. Um, then later, um, when I was, when I was really young, there's this little purple P that's, that's sitting there um, right after Farsi, which it turns out I was singing to this record in Portuguese, Brazilian Portuguese, uh, for about a year or so. Then I went to, uh, so I stayed in the U.S. I would go, I would be in the U.S. during the year. I would spend um, in Mexico summers with my, my uh, mom's family. And, and at 14, I went for a year entirely to, to Mexico, came back, went to high, finished high school here in the U.S., in Santa Monica and Los Angeles. So I, was, I was, uh, grew up in the Northern California, then went to abroad for a year and stayed an extra year in Brazil, eventually lost my accent in Portuguese. So I had no, no, not people couldn't tell I wasn't Brazilian, which is a freaky thing. Um, and I think part of it was this early experience in Portuguese singing to this record somehow got my ear and my mouth tuned to those Brazilian sounds. And so I had this really bad Spanish accent in Portuguese that it kind of peeled off over time. And then later around 35, I decided I was going to take my hand at German. And that was really hard. And it's still hard uh, to do German because it's so much later and there's so many other things that are just not natural to me. I mean, I really know what it's like to be a foreign language learner when I learn German. But this is a talk about skill building. This is my uncle, my uncle, my mom's youngest brother, who's two years older than me, was really like my big brother to me. And I think we were here at some aquarium in, 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 uh, in the US when he came to visit. Most of the time I went to visit him, he came a couple of times to the US to visit us. Um, and this is me in Brazil a few years later with a lot more hair than I have now. And then when I had, when I was younger, little spotting, sporting this little beard, right? And then in my last trip to Germany with my family. So my wife's there in the middle, my son next to me, my youngest daughter next to my wife, and then my oldest daughter at the end, and then my brother-in-law and their son who didn't want to come out in the picture was actually a, a soccer player. Turns out I have two connections to soccer. The other connection is my uncle. So my uncle... Um, here's a picture of us in two, a few years, a few, a few years later than the earlier one I showed you, right, with my daughter and his son. And the interesting thing about my uncle is he started playing soccer. So he actually would used to play. I remember he used to actually play it in, in the, in, so he, the, my, my, uh, grandmother had this open like bathtub. It wasn't even a bathtub. It was like a shower with a curtain, right? So very Mexican with just a lot of cement around it and then some tile. And he would play soccer in the shower. <laughs> like when the water, he'd stop the shower that he'd play, be playing soccer in there. So he's always with the ball. He was the one who got me into sports. I was really uncoordinated. Um, I mean, not really uncoordinated, but I just wasn't very athletic. You know, I was kind of pudgy. I was slow. I even joked to my uncle that everybody says I'm fast now. And I said, well, I just didn't, you know, I just kind of stopped getting slow. That's what happened. Cause I was always slow and everybody else just got slower than me. So now they say I'm fast, but I don't know where that came from. Um, so he was always the athletic one. And this is kind of his, his experience, right? Soccer and then transitioning to tennis at, at around 15, because maybe 13, 14, because, you know, they, they just, he was really good and they would beat up on him. It wasn't organized. It was Mexico. He said they would like, you know, spit at him, kick him, pull him, scratch him to stop him because he was that good. And my uncle, my, my older uncle said he could do stuff with the ball that was just amazing. So, but he moved to tennis. He wanted to do tennis, played some on the pro circuit, became a coach. And that's, you see that picture later. My experience was completely different. So I played some kickball when I was young. I played some football, like just in the yard. I played, I did the only official sport I played my, my entire life before tennis was baseball. I played on my junior high team. And when I learned tennis, the interesting thing about it is I was actually not that bad. I mean, I wasn't great like the young learners were, but I was actually not that bad. I could actually do a lot of stuff. And so it was surprising to me that I, I could do that much now that I reflect back on it. Um, I would play like you know, top players on the tennis team and I, I wouldn't beat them, but I could hang with them. And so um, nobody liked playing with me because I played so differently, right? And partly it was because of all these other sports. And this, and then of course, later I got into coaching my kids. So here's my son hitting a backhand. There's my oldest daughter hitting a backhand. 
And, and when I thought about this, I really thought there are two different ways we can think about how we learn new skills, right? So one way, and I'll talk about this in a minute, is like what I'd call an additive, right, ideas, right? So the more you do, the better you get. And, and, and I'm, I'm never, no one, you'll never get me to tell you that the more you do, you'll get worse. I'm not, I'm not going to actually try to argue that, um, that you should do less, um, you know, like not at all. Um, Hours practice matters, right? How many hours you do something makes a difference, right? But I'm gonna try to tweak that a little bit with a different idea, which is that learning can be nonlinear, right? That things like my tennis experience, especially in a late developing sport like tennis, you can take a lot of these other little skills, put them together and you can create tennis out of them. And I think that that generalizes to other sports too, as I look around um, as well. So let's think about the, the you know, the, I think the, the most prominent one, at least in psychology of an additive framework, and that would be Anders Ericsson's idea of uh, deliberate practice, right? So his idea is that, and this is from Anders Ericsson's uh, publication, and I can't see the down below, but it's in the, in the, in the 90s, I believe. Um, he published this idea that you could have these sort of everyday kinds of skills, right? That become very automatic. We do, you know, open a car, drive, things like that. Uh, then we could have arrested development, right? So, so people get good, but they just don't get good enough. And that's kind of the point that we really want to think about between arrested development and expert performance. Like what is the difference between those things? And so he does argue that there's something cognitive or associative about it. And this is again from a study of his in the, in the 90s, right? Um, where, and, and Anders, you know, as you'll see in a bit, I, I met with him and, and what became clear to me was that this is where he could get really good data. So Anders was looking for really good data. And one place you could get it is when you looked at music academies and how many hours people practice. He wanted to figure out, as you practice more, do you get better? And, and specifically, what type of practice would you get? And so what you see here really clearly is, um, I don't know how to do, so let's see. Oh yeah, hold on a second. So what you see here clearly is that the people who, so in early, early in life, right? Pretty much everybody's together. It doesn't, you know, professionals, best experts, good experts, amateurs, least accomplished experts, and then we have pianists and we have violinists, right? You can see everybody's down here, but then these lines start to diverge somewhere around age 10, right? 10 to 12, you start to see that the best experts diverge. And interestingly, it looks like, and we can't see if these are different or not, the best experts seem to be a little bit better than the professionals who then eventually take up. So they, they end up roughly in the same place since this is how many hours they practice this is the age of of uh, the musicians and you can also see the good experts of course practice less least accomplished experts practice less and amateurs practice even less right so this would clearly show that the more people practice especially as they get into teenage right so over 10 up into the teenage they get better so practice makes perfect right nothing surprising there at least not from us. The surprising thing was the Stan guy. So this Stan guy, I found out from a student of mine, um, who who uh, so it's Joe Pirazzolo. He he said there's this guy Dan who's trying to use the Anders Ericsson's approach of trying to get to the ten thousand hours. So in this time, Gladwell had coined the term ten thousand hours to say once you do ten thousand hours of this kind of practice, you get to be really good. Right. And in his book, Outliers, that's where he, where he kind of outlines that. It's not exactly what Erickson said, but that was Gladwell's take on it. And then the 10,000 hours became this big thing that everybody knew about. So Dan took this to heart. He decided to, he didn't really um, have a job or anything. He was just hanging out with his brother playing golf. He says, how good could I get if I do 10,000 hours of practice? I'm 30 years old. He was, he had done some sports, but never really played golf seriously. Um, just, you know, kind of put it around. So that's what he did. He actually created the Dan plan, which was this really nice website where he talks about, um, you know, how, how, uh, how he practiced. It's all on there. You can, he has a book too on Amazon. I, I bought it. It tells you everything about what he did, his experience um, across, across, I think, three or four years. Um, 
And so this is what happened. So this is kind of going down. So this is his handicap in golf. Right? And this is the hours of deliberate practice. The deliberate practice idea from Anders Ericsson is that you have to be focused with feedback. There's all kinds of, he has all kinds of conditions for deliberate practice. And so Dan worked with Anders directly, right? To kind of think about how do I practice to really work on his practice routine um, with the idea that he could get better. And he got quite good. He got pretty close to actually pro level, right? What we would consider pro level in golf within about three years. Problem is his back gave out, right? And so um, that was that was kind of problematic, right? That his back gave out and he really couldn't play golf anymore. So maybe the three years was a little too accelerated. So, so with all that in mind, in 2019, um, I was going to Florida State, and I wrote Anders actually on the plane by chance, uh, see if he could have dinner or meet with me. I was going to a different meeting. Give me a second. I'm just gonna. There's a wasp in in, in on my windowsill, so I just want to make sure it doesn't get to me. Man, that's a stubborn wasp. Sorry, guys. Okay, I think I got it. <laughs> Sorry. I just didn't want it flying on me and <laughs> biting me or me having to shoo it off while I'm in the middle of the talk. Okay. So, anyway. Um, so, so Anders, you know, he actually, he responded. I, I like was on the Wi-Fi on the plane. I write him an email. He writes, I land, he writes me back immediately. Yeah, I can meet this evening. I was uh, surprised. He, um, I get on another plane. This was Tallahassee. There's no direct flight from Houston. So, uh, so I, I get on another plane. Um, and when I get off, he's like, oh, I see that your plane's landing late. So I adjusted the, the reservation, go to have dinner person shows up, asks me, is this a special occasion? And I tell and I tell the waiter, right? We're sitting, both sitting there, waiters asking us. I say, you know, it's not every day you get to meet your academic hero. Of course, that kind of made him blush, threw him off. He said something about, you know, me help being there with him or something. But it's true. I mean, I really have great admiration for the work that Anders did. But I always had a question in my mind. I always wondered, okay, this is great. You have all these hours, you know, deliberate practice. It works well, but there were really two questions that kind of popped up into my mind, um, and and I'm and I'm going to bring an analogy. Um, and because tennis is a late developing sport, I always thought of development a little bit differently, right? Than when you start really early. Well, you can start pretty early in tennis, but but you know not as early I think as soccer, um, because the ball is just up in the air, and there's stuff that is complicated for little little kids to do. So. I always think of the tennis serve. Let's see if I can get this. Oh no, don't tell me my videos won't work on Zoom. I think my videos will not work on Zoom. So this is supposed to be a video of, um, let's see, hold on, let's see if I get out of my pointer, see if that'll work. Yeah, that's it. All right. Whew. Okay, so this is a video I made of Federer uh, hitting a serve in, in Halle in Germany at a tournament. The only time I got to see him live, which is quite a treat. And this is just what it looks like when you see one of the people with one of the best serves. Uh, I think, you know, we could argue of, of all time, but certainly there have been better servers than him, but it's very, very good, right? And it's just explosive, fast. It's just, it's like, you know, people have called it like a religious experience watching Federer. There's one little part about this that's hidden, and that is the turning of the arm from throwing, right? I was always told that tennis serve was a throwing motion, but most people like me would throw down, right? And then I realized, oh no, there's this weird thing that they never told me, which was, no, you actually throw like this, right? So your arm actually flips out from there. It doesn't go straight down. That's how pitchers generate so much power. And that's how you get a spiral on, on American football is you doing that. And if you look at the tennis serve, you can see, it's kind of hard to see in this picture, but you can see it from Ash Barty here, which we'll talk about a 
little bit later, and this other serve, that the, the racket actually flips out, which makes no sense because it's, how is it going to flip out? Don't you hit the side fence? And no, it turns out you don't. But that's just the way you can accelerate your arm because you get more motion, right? And I like to think of this because it's really a bunch of different skills. You're, you're having to generate power from the ground. You're pushing it up through your torso, up through your, your upper body, through your arm, through your shoulder, right? Until that little moment when you have impact, because it's a very short moment that you're hitting the ball, and then it goes. Right. And you have to hit it, you have to hit it high up in the air and it's got to light come down. It's got to land inside this box over the net. Seems trivial, easy. It's not hard to do. You could just do it like that. Uh, I wouldn't advise you do that at a high level of tennis because it'll be a pain, a lot of pain. And so this is basically kind of me working with my daughter. Um, across the years, I made a video of, of videos like like all good parents with their kids of her serving, right? So that's her when she's around eight, a little bit older, then a little bit older. And you can see there's some little things that she needs to perfect. And then now about a year ago in the fall and now just a couple of weeks ago, right? In a full, full blown point, right? Where the, all of that is integrated in having to coordinate all those different things. But there were a couple of things that I, I actually think I got wrong. Um, and that, and one of them, some that I wasn't too bad. I did have her throw footballs. I did have her throw balls, but I feel like I could have actually worried less about the whole serve, especially when she was really young. And later coaches told me, oh, you should just throw the ball for her and have her sit at the net and go like that, you know, like an overhead, like you're just practicing. Don't worry so much. And I, I was being like a very overprotective dad and like, you know, at this, if they're not good at this age, will they be good later? Um, and so, I mean, you know, every we, you're, we're, we're well, we're well intentioned as parents, right? Or as like in my case, like a parent kind of coach would be. But sometimes we go too fast, right? And we expect too much. Um, and so it's just a really long, drawn out process for that kind of a shot, as you can see from a really young age all the way to that's just the serve, right? That's just the beginning of the point to get her to to where it is today. And that's not even with any aspiration of going to college or anything like that, or pro, definitely not any aspiration to pro level at this point. So you have to throw something in the air. You gotta get the shoulder to rotate. You gotta do this pronation thing, which everybody thinks about. That's just a result. And when you ask high level people, like they asked Patrick McEnroe, asked Federer a few years ago, what are you thinking about when, cause he had gone on, he would go on these runs where he just served like boom 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 i win a game in a minute i mean in fact i had a friend who would go get tea he says you know i'd heat up my tea when i got back federer wasn't serving anymore because he'd already won his game and it's just like boom 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 right and they asked him like what are you thinking he goes nothing he's not thinking anything and my daughter reports the same thing if i don't just think about it it's better if i start trying to tweak it it gets worse um and Andy Roddick had a very famous, very unorthodox serve. They, he actually said, "Don't." One of the things he would tell people is, "Don't ask me about my serve. <laughs> like, don't ask me. I don't want to. I don't want to know. I don't want to think about it. I'm just going to play. So just leave me alone." He told people immediately because they'd start out like, "What are you doing?" He's like, "No, that's just going to mess me up." So there's this, you know, this thing becomes really automatic, really fast. You know, this, this whole thing becomes, it goes from all these little mini skills, right? And there's even something weird Roddick does where he takes a step back instead of forward in his serve, which is really unorthodox. I don't think anybody does anything like that, but it just becomes this big chunk, right? And it, and it, and so like the, all these little mini things combined, they become this big skill, but you have all these little mini skills. And so that, that got me thinking, you know, when I think about the serve, when I think about language, I think about all these mini things combined. And I'm just kind of like, how does that happen? How do we do that? Right? Because we're so good at doing that for good and for bad, right? Mini skills sometimes kind of take us in the wrong direction. And we do things that are not as uh, good, right? For a particular skill. Um, but but really the limitation for me was like what's development right and and how do we how does a brain tell us something about the way these things combine how we build these skills how these skills come together right into bigger skills more complex things and then how we combine them in even bigger ones right some just from motor skills to all the types of things that I showed you at the end right which is I have to serve the ball is going to come back I have to prepare 
I have to know where that, I have to know, and I'm not talking about no, I just have to hit the ball to a particular place and then I have to wait for it again. And so there's this whole flow of the point, right? Which involves all these different strokes. Um, and you, you somehow have to keep all of that in your mind as you get older. So this was a, this was a chance. Uh, so in my quest of trying to be like a dad, you know, dad coach kind of, you know, amateur coach idea, I stumbled upon a book uh, about development on, of, of, uh, by a German, two German authors on, on tennis development. And the interesting thing about it was it looks a lot like Anders Ericsson's figure, right? So we have this arrested development arrested kind of development curve. And then we have this sort of expertise curve. And what really blew my mind was, right? So that I think this is for males, because I think for females, it's a little bit earlier, but for males, right? The peak of a tennis player's sort of ability, if you will, is 24 to 26, at least back then. I think maybe it's been extended out a little bit more uh, for certain players. Um, and, and so I was really thinking about, well, I'm making decisions, you know, a lot of parents are making decisions and coaches are making most, maybe more parents, coaches, what, you know, I don't want to lay any blame, but we're thinking about where our kid is at 12 or at 10. And we're not thinking that the peak is 12 years later, right? So when I saw this figure, I thought, oh my goodness, this is exactly what's happening. I would go to tennis tournaments and I would see kids really, really good. But what happened, and this is, again, according to these two people, right, these two authors, is based on their data, what, hold on a second. It's asking me a question. Sorry, it's just my computers being problematic. Okay, oh, there we go. Sorry, it's just asking me if I'll if I'm okay. It's okay for me to show online videos, but I don't know why it asked me now. So the, the really interesting thing was right how long the developmental curve is. Right, it's really long, and and I think you know for coaches they know they know this. Teachers know this in some way. My parents definitely know this because they see change across time. But to me, it's hard to get out of being in that little moment where I'm thinking about my daughter's serve and her pronating and not thinking, wait, you know, in, in six or seven years, what am I gonna do now to put her in like the best position, right? Which is also what I get in the bilingual world. People ask me like, what's the best pattern to teach your kid a foreign language, right? When should you start? I said, depends on what your goal is. If your goal is for them to do well in an AP test, probably that's not so important that you start early. If you want them to sound like a native speaker, yeah, the earlier the better. That window closes earlier, sounding like a native speaker. Being able to read and write, you can start relatively late and be pretty good, um, depending on the language. Um, so I think it's it's always that question, like, where are we and where are we going, right? And this really blew my mind that sometimes kids that look really, really advanced at a young age, and that was his point here with this curve here, they can look actually more advanced at younger ages, right, um, actually are... Uh, have less of an upside. And these were two different types of training, right? So this, you see this is basic training, lots of developmental training up to 14, connecting training from 14 to 18. So that's actually putting things together and not bringing in top performance training until like 18 to 20, which seems really late to me. Um, based on what I've seen people do, they do more like this, a little bit of developmental training, they put them immediately into connecting training, and they put them in top performance at 14 for tennis. And that may be too early for some kids, right? Some kids just aren't ready. So I had to keep reminding myself of that. So, so then, and I'll make this a little bit clearer, because this is kind of a really, really out there point. Um, and, and I sometimes get pushed back at home or from people who read my stuff and say, wait, wait, you got to bring this, bring us back down to earth, right? So this is Teilhard de Chardin, this guy who is actually a paleontologist, a Catholic priest paleontologist in the 1920s, you can imagine. They actually banished him to China because they didn't like his, his ideas on evolution. But he had this really cool idea, which is that the world is actually these different spheres, right? So he thought of the world as spheres. He said the really basic world are molecules, 
Then from those molecules, they combine, they create cells. From those cells, they combine to create life. And from that life, we got humans. And so he taught, thought about this last sort of globe around the world was human culture. And you're like, okay, what does this have to do with skill building? So I'll, I'll get back, uh, hopefully this will be clear at the end. Um, so in this whole time that I, you know, I was thinking about how things change across time, about the tennis serve, about all this stuff, right? One day, you know, I was telling Tom that this was really by chance because I don't even watch real sports, but I was just bored. And, and what I was telling Tom is, I, you know, about 15 years ago, we cut cable because we had 200 channels. And then we only, my wife and I and my kids would watch maybe about eight. And why am I paying all this money for, eight, you know, for, for eight channels? So we cut it. And then we just watched over the air TV and recorded stuff and bought movies. And then all these apps came in, right? The internet came in. And now I'm back to the same thing. Like, do I watch Hulu? Do I watch Netflix? Do I watch HBO Max? Do I watch Prime Video? Like, what do I watch, right? So one day I was just, I, I watch, I end up watching sports because it relaxes me. And everybody wonders like, why are you watching all these sports? Said, it's just relaxing. It's like, it's my, my wife likes to watch construction shows, like rebuilding, you know, that's not relaxing to me. But if I watch sports, it's really interesting. So I put, I'm scrolling through real sports and I see this, I don't just, ah, let's see if there's something interesting. Ah, it doesn't look so good. And I see this thing on soccer sensei. And I, I joked to Tom, I thought maybe it's like the karate kid or something, right? You know? And so I said, well, let me watch this one. It sounds interesting. It sounds different. And that was, that's, here's an example of it. I started watching this and I just, my mind is blown because here is someone who's essentially thinking about what the core, right, of soccer is, right? So the core for me for tennis serve is this motion. That's the core. Everything is trying to do this. Anything that slows this down is not useful. Anything that speeds this up and makes it better is useful. That's throwing. He was doing the same thing, but with his kids with ball manipulation. And that was the core of soccer. And so when I thought about, okay, so now let's go back to Teilhard de Chardin and say, why is this so cool, right? So why is this paleontologist idea back hundred years ago relevant at all to skill building? Well, look at the geosphere. So what are the molecules, right? What's, what are the building blocks of life? How do they combine to form cells? How do they combine to form life, right? We go all across evolution up to humans right? And then how does that combine to create culture? We can think of the same thing of how do you take little small things and make them into bigger things? And that is a natural system. It's an outcome of a natural system approach. So I would say that the idea of soccer starts at home, that's that, that the ball and the human become one, right? If you think about it from Teilhard de Chardin's point of view, it makes complete sense that you wouldn't start a process. It's like saying, oh, I'm gonna start learning language at six. Well, that's not true, right? I mean, before birth, actually, uh, humans can recognize uh, different sounds through the womb, through the wall, like fetuses, I think seven, eight months, right? Uh, pregnancy, they can recognize sounds already. They're born already recognizing sounds because they can hear them. They don't hear them exactly the way we do. They're actually muffled but they have the building blocks of language already there at birth. So it makes sense that if you have this ball and you're walking, that you could walk with the ball at a really young age and that that would create a different line of development, right? Um, and so it's much more developmental. And to me, that blew my mind. I was like so excited about this. This is way before I was even thinking of writing the book. I was just kind of doing reconnaissance, you know, just collecting information, thinking about it. And then the book was born out of all that collection, watching HBO Max. Maybe I should deduct it from my taxes. <laughs> but anyway, this is, uh, this. so this is, um, hold on, let me see if I can turn my pointer off so I can get the video. So this is a three video, I, the only three, I think Tom sent me four, but I only got three in here um, of, of his son, right? at different ages. So you can see again, this sort of ball manipulation um, at a really young age. He said this was around two, he's just walking with the ball. And then it'll segue in a second to three, one year later, 
my daughter was blown away by this. She's like, oh my goodness, that's incredible. She couldn't believe it, my youngest daughter. And then now in action, right? Full flown, there we go. And, and, and Tom can tell us what age that was, because. I think he was 10. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I think it was so, 10. Or so that's from two to 10, right? This core skill now integrated into a game situation, just like Teilhard de Chardin talks about going from molecules, right, to life, right? It's the same thing. It's an expansion right across time from little skills to big skills, combining and recombining, which is not something that we really get from Anders Ericsson's point of view. Anders Ericsson just says, practice these skills. And again, I'm, I'm giving you a promissory note because I don't know how they combine and recombine. I think the science of that is there's a lot to be done, but I'm fascinated by how we can do it because it's pretty amazing that humans can do that um, quite well, right? So, so here's, here's one idea that, that comes from Teilhard de Chardin, right? He calls it infolding. He says that every layer folds in, right? And gets absorbed to create another layer. And so you get this infolding. So first, if you look at stage one in that video, you'll see mostly it's one foot moving the ball. Then stage two is both feet moving the ball. And then the ball disappears, right? I think if you ask, if you ask your son, where's the ball? And in a second, I'll show you, it actually does disappear. Because if you ask experts, where's the ball? They actually do worse. Um, in a second, I'll show you data that, that reveals that. But it disappears. It's not there anymore. It's an extension of their bodies, right? But if you don't start figuring out getting that connection early enough, right, then it becomes its exterior thing, not an interior thing. So again, right, this idea of infolding, that's Teilhard de Chardin talking about evolution, I think fits really nicely with human development and how we can think about skills kind of blossoming, blooming, right? Some more natural, not building, but blooming. And that's a really different way to think about skills um, from sort of a natural systems kind of view. So how does the brain do all this, right? Where does the brain kind of center in? The brain does its infolding too. It's folded in a lot for us, right? Um, it, it, and I won't give you a whole rundown of brain development, but what I will tell you is we have these very Import these sort of basic centers. You could think about the brain as a sensory motor machine, right? So we have here auditory cortex. So that's listening. Anytime we hear anything in the world, brain activity appears there. Anytime we feel something on our bodies, somatosensory, which is a really nice word for like our body sense, right? That's in this part of the brain will be active. If we move at all, um, hold on. This thing's asking me to enable media. Okay. Um, if we move at all, then, then you get a primary motor cortex. The back of the brain, if you see anything, you'll get lighting up in the back of the brain. And that's really, those systems come online earlier. The systems involved in sensing and moving are the first ones to develop. These other two areas called the parietal lobe and the frontal lobe come on later. So first, it's this sort of very basic sensory motor kind of processing in language would be like babbling, right? Crawling, <laughs> you can think of as a sensory motor thing, right? Walking, those come online first, and then the, the, the brain fills out and we start to combine stuff. And that's what you see in brain maturation, right? So the blue areas are more mature, the red and the green areas, sorry, the red, yeah, the blue, uh, the red and green are more mature. Wait, hold on. Yes, the blue is the more mature part of the cortex. So what you'll see here is like primary motor areas are very active. This is the top of the brain. Right? So roughly like here, those are very, those are more mature at an earlier age. Notice the back of the brain is very blue. We're very good at seeing. I think by about three, we have pretty good vision. Um, not, you know, like detecting things, seeing things in the world, seeing color, seeing motion, identifying objects, those, those come in really early in life. And as we go through time, you see these frontal areas and these areas that I call the parietal cortex. Parietal cortex combines senses. Frontal cortex and parietal cortex together combine senses and movements, 
right? So you have senses and movements that are kind of separate that start to be combined more and more into more and more complex kinds of thinking, right? When we think about decision-making, planning, the kinds of things that a 10-year-old or 12-year-old, 13-year-old soccer player might start to do, right? Which would be around here, which is someone's here, they're all around me, I should pass the ball. <laughs> Not I should just run with the, you know, if you look at really young kids, they just all chase the ball, right? I mean, that's kind of what they're doing. And that's exactly what they should be doing because their brains are set up to focus on like very simple little sensory motor stuff, right? They're, they're not kind of planning the way we do. And in a way that's a blessing, right? Because they can focus on these little things. They don't have to worry about the big things. Those things are not as, comp their life is not as complicated, right? And so as we get older, then we can integrate, we can plan, we can predict we can sort of foresee, right? We can go to the past and say, wait, that happened in the past. Maybe I should do something differently. All those types of things. Really, we're looking at age 20, even older, right? Maybe in the mid 20s, around the time that that curve peaked out for tennis is around the time that the brain is starting to be able to do all these complicated things um, that we do as adults. Um, the interesting thing about was another by chance was uh, 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 some stuff that I was reading about expertise that really interested me from C.N. Bylock. C.N. Bylock was a professor at University of Chicago for many, many, many years. Um, and she did this really interesting work on uh, choke, on, on choking, basically, on what happens when people get under very difficult situations. Why is it they're, they're, um, that they break down under pressure? And um, she, she had some administrative posts and she was so successful. I mean, part of this was born from her own experience of having tried out. I think she had something like she could have qualified for the Olympic training team or something in soccer. So she, I think she was a goalie, if I'm not wrong. Um, and she shows up and she plays really poorly. Um, and she's like, why? I mean, I, I, I played so much worse than I did. So she turned that into kind of a question of, of one of the questions in her career, which is why do people choke under pressure? This really nice book she published, another book on, on embodied cognition. Um, and then eventually she, uh, Barnard College decided they wanted a president and that she would be the best ideal candidate and she accepted. So she's now president of Barnard College, which is part of Columbia. Um, or associated with Columbia, I should say. Um, uh, and, and she's done a lot of work on, on choking and, and her work was on this, right? So if you look at novices and experienced, right? So this is, a, this is soccer players, right? Um, when you look at, so the right foot, these are right foot dominant ones, right? So if you look at novices, they had two different tasks. So one task was tell me something of like, I think it was the side of the foot on the ball. Tell me what side, you know, tell me when the ball hits this side of the foot. And the other one's a dual task. They actually heard, I think they heard tones or words. And then later they had to recognize if that was the same thing they had heard while they were dribbling. So it's like a dual task versus focus on your body part. And if you notice, the experienced people do better in dual task when they're listening to tones. Um, and I've heard of tennis players that actually sing songs to themselves while they're playing with the idea that... I don't know, they're just singing the song and I'm playing it. I, I can play better because I'm, you know, I, like I'm not thinking. Um, so they did just fine with a dual task. But when you tell them to tend to a body part, they do worse. And the novices are actually the opposite. The interesting thing is if you look at the left foot, they're the same. So it's, that seems to be true for the dominant foot, but not for the non-dominant foot, for the experienced. So um, novices are actually um, slightly, uh, slightly worse at dual task and slightly better at, at focusing on the foot, which is true because if you're just learning to play soccer and you're an adult, I'm going to be like, well, I don't really do this very well. So what side of my foot is it? I have to really think very consciously of what I'm doing. The expert doesn't. The expert, it's infolded. They don't know. It, their body has disappeared. It's no longer. And when you ask them to pull it out, they do worse. Uh, this is a, the same type of thing with golf. And so what I did is I, I wrote Sian an email and I said, you know, I'm going to be in Chicago. I'd like to see, you know, if we could meet. And so she said, sure, let's go. You know, so we're, we're having a drink. She says, so why are you here? <laughs> Tell me what's on your mind. So, you know, she didn't say it that way, but she said, you know, she kind of said, well, so, so why, what brought you all this way? You know, in a slightly nicer way than I said at the beginning. And she, and so I said, well, you know, I'm really curious because no one's ever talked about age of acquisition and sport. Like, 
when you start playing sports, how does that have an effect um, on these things? So, I mean, no one's ever published anything on that. And I do this stuff in language and we find these really robust effects, right? In memory and language, but I've never seen it in sport. And it must be, the, it must be an effect of having learned a sport earlier or later on how you represent it. Um, so, so she came, she wrote me back a few months later and she said, yeah, you know what, we can do this. We can actually do this with, we, ha I have a student, uh, who's doing a master's thesis. And I thought we could actually adapt my approach of looking at skill focused, right? So what body parts moving a single task, just putting, this is golf players and a dual task where they listen to words. And so she did, she, they ran this study and they found that they, 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 here's the very fancy apparatus in, in her lab at the time, right? Looking at golf putting, you can look at distance, uh, you can look at errors. So what I'll show you is errors. And what, what they did is they divided the group into those who learned golf before age 10 and after age 10. And here are the three conditions. And what you see is that two, those two lines don't differ, right? So when they just putt, they're, they're equated for their handicap level. So when they just putt, they're the same. When they're listening to words, they're the same. Although I think on the secondary task, listening to words, the earlier learners do better than, but this is just putting errors, right? And on skill focused, that's where you really see the difference. The early learners do worse when they're asked to attend to a body part. That means that, at least our interpretation is, that the earlier you learn a sport, the more it's kind of incorporated into your body, right? It, 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 you, it's gone. It's not there anymore. You're just doing it. For the late learners, they actually learned in a way almost consciously thinking about. So if you think about tennis with me, I learned a lot of the stuff consciously, right? Because I was 16 when I started playing tennis for reals. So it's much more conscious than it was for someone who's young. So my daughter is like always complaining, like, don't tell me what to do. Just show me and then I'll do it. And I talk too much, right? Because I'm always talking through everything that I'm doing. It's very conscious for me, not for her. We also did a second study where we looked at experts and non-experts listening to sports sounds, right? So sports sounds that in the brain scanner, right? Um, when, when they're listening to sports sounds in their sport versus another sport, and this is just the brain activity for their sport versus uh, recreational players listening to their sport. And what you see are two brain areas. One is a motor planning area, and the other is a sort of a somatosensory area, very close to somato body parts. So it's almost as if you could think about it this way. When someone who's an expert, uh, a college athlete in this case, hears the sound in their sport, they activate a motor plan, right? The recreational player does that less so. Those brain areas devoted to a motor plan are less active. So this is an expertise effect, not an age effect. We tried to look at the age effect, but that was trickier in this, in this population. We, we didn't have uh, as much luck doing that. But then we can ask the question is, well, can we be too specialized? So let me see, let me go down here and see if this works. So this is a few years ago, Albert Pujols. Let's see if I just click on it, it should start. Um, okay. Maybe not. So this is um, actually a video of Albert Pujols. So Albert Pujols, um, a few years ago, I think her name is Jenny Finch, was a softball pitcher. And they brought out a bunch of all stars to practice. Um, she 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 basically pitched to the to all star baseball players, and she struck them all out. They couldn't hit the ball. And the interesting thing about it is, well, there are differences between softball and baseball, right? The differences are that in softball, right, the mound is closer, it's a different height, and it's thrown underhand. And so, they actually, in the video, what ends up happening is Pujols strikes out here, and she ends up being able to strike out pretty much all the baseball players because they're specialized to a baseball thrown overhand farther away. Smaller ball, farther distance, overhand. They're so specialized, they can't adapt to this other skill, right? And so they're actually struck out, which is interesting that that happens to adults. They get so specialized that when you take them out of their, out of their specialization, they sometimes don't do as well. So... Basically, all of this comes down to sort of 
these kind of basic ideas, right? Which is that early learning is an extension of our bodies. Late learning is less so, right? But I'm not saying it's not, I'm just saying it's less so. Um, and that expertise tunes our brain to our sport, right? It, it, tuned, it tunes our brains and our body, right? They become like these chunks from these little mini chunks, they become these chunks. I think if you took a 10 year old or a 12 year old baseball player and had them play softball, they might have more success, right? Than the pro players, because at that point, it's like their skills are not that well developed and they're a little bit, they have more plat, what's called plasticity or flexibility. And so they might actually do better than an adult who's practiced so much more, right? I did want to put this up just to show you that there are these different, people have talked about these different windows within development. Um, so this is, again, um, it always comes back to the home, right? So one of the interesting things about um, very early, this is called juvenile, this very early stage is that there's a lot of, you see here, sensory systems, language, reading and writing basics, right? Of course, it's the environment as a family. In adolescence is another window that opens. Social interactions become really important for adolescents. It's, it's how to get along with others, how to navigate the world. The social world becomes really important. And then in adulthood, right, it's another set of issues that we have to deal with as adults. So you have these different windows of development that open and close with different um, things that people are trying to deal with. And if we think about it from the brain, like why would social be important? Well, that's no longer about me. So really young kids will be egocentric, right? They'll actually think that everyone sees the world the way they do when they're really young. And I know you might think some adults are like that too, but I mean, I mean, really like not just that they may be um, selfish. I'm talking about, they literally, if you take a, um, a dog and you put a cat mask on the dog, and you ask a really young child, is it a dog or a cat? The young child, like a three-year-old will say, well, that's a, that's a cat because it looks like a cat. But once they get a little bit older, you can take a cat mask and put it on a dog. And you ask a five-year-old, is that a dog or a cat? They say, oh, that's a dog, right? Just like when I took my daughter to, I would take her to the, the Halloween stores. She would freak out for about, you know, when she was like three or four, she just was scared. Like she would be clinging to me and not looking. And then about two years later, she's like, oh, it's all pretend it's not real anymore, right? It just looks scary. So that kind of ability to see things, right? In a broader sense, then you get to, to adolescence and then it's, okay, who is that person? How do we interact, right? They get all this drama, right? They're all, they develop clicks et cetera, et cetera, right? That's all part of adolescence, it's normal. And then adulthood, things shift again. And the really, one of the interesting stories, and here I will try to probably get my, see if I can get this video to work, if I have to get out of the presentation, that's okay, is, uh, is Ash Barty. Ash Barty really came on my radar because suddenly I remember I was watching tennis. Now, now I pretty much what I watch is tennis most of the time, unless I'm like, I'm like sometimes I get bored of tennis, like, okay, let me go watch real sports. Let me watch basketball, or watch the World Series, watch the World Cup, even the Euro Cup. I'll watch the Euro Cup final. Um, but anyway, I hear this, you know, Ash Barty's come back to tennis. I'm like, who is this Ash Barty, right? I didn't, I didn't know about her, um, which is interesting. And this is supposed to be a video which is not going to work. So let's see if I can get out. Of I here. think, I think Artur, if you, if you um, bring the, yeah, click on there, it, it'll play. It should. Yeah. It's just bugging out. Try, right. try it again. Or, or get into the full presentation again and bring the, the uh, cursor down. I've had this, I've had this happen to me before as well. So if you launch it again, Yep, there. Okay, now go 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 down to the bottom. Yeah, yeah, and move it to the left. L lift more. Yeah, and then a little bit higher. Sometimes you no no you've got it. Yeah, it doesn't. Oh, see, it. yeah, it's not it's not popping up. Yeah, it usually Somebody, does. Oh. Uh, let's see. Someone is saying enable content in the top right. Yeah, it asked me, and I did. Oh, on the top right. Yeah, click enable content in top right, right of PowerPoint slide. Yeah, but I don't, yeah, it's not, yeah, it's PowerPoint's being finicky. 
Um, so let me see if I can find it on YouTube because I think this is worth um, shouldn't be too hard. This 30 second habit you can you guys can hear that? Did you guys yeah, just we hear can that? hear, but we can't see anything. Yeah. Okay. So let me just uh, do a new share. Oh no, no, sorry. Hold on. Do I do stop sharing and then reshare? Yep. Good, good adaptation, Arturo. Impressive. Thank you. Impressive. Well, for this one, I, I wanted it to be, uh, so let's see. Okay, hold on. Let me just make sure I get the right one. So you guys should be able to Your see home completely reverses type 2 diabetes in six weeks okay. without medic. So this is Ash Barty's story. Um, genuine. I mean what I say. I'm not going to feed around the bush. I'll tell you what I think, whether you like it or not. Always here for good luck. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Ash Barty, and this is my story. My very first memory was asking mum and dad to play. My wife's sister-in-law rang up her uncle and auntie, and they said, oh, well, if you're going to go anywhere, go and see Jim Joyce at West Brisbane Tennis. I remember driving past West Brisbane Tennis Centre. There's one top court that you see from the road, and I was very fortunate to stumble across one of the best coaches in the world. I remember my first lesson with Jim. I was about, I think it was a week or 10 days until I turned five years old. It was a, a Saturday morning lesson and it was would have been like an eight o'clock or an 8.30 lesson, all the, all the little kitties out before it gets hot in Queensland. I remember that he tried to turn us away because I was too young. We said, she's four but turning five in a few weeks. He said, no, too young. I don't start them until they're seven. And I was shattered. All I wanted to do was play tennis. He said, look, you're already here, come out in the court. So I grabbed a racket and I remember hitting my first ball. Jim just looked over at her and said, darling, you can come back next week. I still remember that day, I really do. Um, the big thing that stood out with Ash was a, obviously a hand-eye coordination. I, it was as good as I've seen in all the years I've been coaching. It's about 40 years this year. I've never seen a kid more keen to, uh, to turn up. Wouldn't matter if there was a big thunderstorm and the courts were all wet. Ash wanted to go down to those tennis courts and turn up. That's on your second court cross. Yeah, court number four. Yeah. See in those days. And it was raining. We probably still played in the rain yeah. back then. That was the days you could still play a bit of a slippery court and get away with it. <laughs> there are still drills I used to do with Jim when I was six, seven, eight years old that I, I'll go out and do on a back court now. That's Ashley Cooper's junior tournament. That's the one where you found out who she was playing and tried to tell her how to beat Ash. I just gave him a couple of tips that Ash had some problems on low forehand. Yeah. And I just wanted to get some practice on, the, on that shot. <laughs> and that's kind of what he was teaching me, is that um, no matter how good you think you are, there's always a level that you can get to. You can always improve. A massive influence is Yvonne. Uh, here's Ash and Yvonne. Ash and a true legend. Yes, absolutely. One of the nicest ladies to ever go on a tennis court. Would have been one of the first times that I guess they got together on the court and had a chat about different things. I think it was at the Australian Open one year when she was 12 or something like that, uh, Yvonne actually made her way over to Ash and introduced herself and they chatted for a while and they've been in touch ever since. I saw her playing here at the Australian Open. It was just good to see somebody who actually serves and volleys and uh, slices and chip shots because that's the sort of thing that made me excited about playing the game. Yvonne has absolutely set the way for all Indigenous tennis players, both male and female. You couldn't get a more genuine person and a better role model. She really is just the most phenomenal person you'll ever meet. All along I was trying to keep her back a bit because I, I just don't believe in kids being thrown out there too early, even though that ended up basically happening. I've had a, some, some really tough times in tennis. My first trip overseas was, I think, six or seven weeks in Europe, uh, and I cried every night. I remember telling mum that I hated it, I hated it, um, and a part of me now still does. Ash, as she got older, probably ended up falling, probably a little bit of a victim of her own success. The junior Wimbledon, for example. What do you do after she wins junior Wimbledon at that age? If I'm being 100% honest, it, it happened way too soon. Uh, I wasn't ready. Walking out to the final, um, I remember, I mean, feeling sick to my stomach. 
I was absolutely cooked. Uh, I really was, and I needed to get home to see my family. And after that, it, it became really tough. It didn't matter that I was ranked two in the world. It didn't, didn't matter that I won Junior Wimbledon. For me, I just wanted to go and play tennis. Um, and, and that changed for me. It's probably one of the best and the worst things that's ever happened to me. And there was one year there, I think, we saw it for 27 days in the year. Now that's, that's pretty tough for a 16, 17 year old kid. Um, especially coming from a family that's as close as ours. And she just decided that was enough. All I was thinking about was getting home to my family. I need a video, but I hate being on camera. What are my options? Sorry, I can guys. hire a presenter. Good old YouTube. I was just able to go back, refresh, be a normal chick. It was just finding myself. I met a great new group of friends through cricket and that took the pressure off tennis a little bit. She came home one day to me and she said, hey, Dad, I just scored my first century. And I thought, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Alan Borderfield playing for Brisbane Heat. It was good fun. Just a natural athlete and she always had great hand-eye, so that doesn't surprise me she could play cricket. <laughs> I found a way to, to still get my individual competitiveness out when I was batting, it's just me. But then having the beauty of, if it's not my day, it's someone else's day in my team. And, um, you know, the, the coach really helped me out with that, understanding that it's not about you. It doesn't have to be about you. And I think that really struck with me. Without that time off, um, we probably would have, she kept on the circuit for another, even another, another year. We probably would never have seen Ash back again. Just being able to open myself up to a new world and sort of get outside of that tennis bubble that we do live in when we're on the road 30 odd weeks a year. I think for me that it just relaxed me um, and I was able to find the drive and the passion to want to play tennis again. My passion just came back. Uh, and All right. You don't have to watch the whole thing. So let me. Um... Oh, wait, no, no. I've came back and I think the key Oops. moment was down at Casey's house. We just had a bu back to sharing. Hold on a second. Back to where I was, which was here. And you guys can see the Yep. So, um, so yeah, so I mean, Ash quits tennis and she does it exactly at the, at the point where we remember those windows, right? And, and this is sort of looking at uh, the, brain, the brain perspective of development from sensory motor cortex, like right, the really early age when she's five, parietal and temporal cord disease, which are now integrating stuff into a higher levels, right? And it's almost like her tennis was ahead of her social and her, um, her ability to, to cope with all of the complications of traveling. The reason she ended up with the Brisbane Heat was they invited her to talk to kids about um, what's it like to travel because she's on the road so far away from home, right? So it's almost like her prefrontal cortex wasn't caught up. She even says it. It was like the greatest blessing and the curse. I just was not... I wasn't ready for that. Phys the physical success was ahead of my mental success, right? So she takes time off. And the interesting thing about me and what I really like is I like, really like this figure where you're looking at her bat and you're looking at her hitting a forehand and you notice that a lot of the muscles and the, what she's using is, is very similar. It transfers across the two sports. And so part of it, I think, is a mental part where she kind of allows herself to relax, to leave tennis, but she also rejiggles all of her tennis um, skills by playing this other sport. So her tennis changes. And I think it wasn't just a mental break. I think it was a physical rejiggling of all those things in adolescence, which is another window of change. So she comes back a better tennis player because she actually builds up skills that help her tennis, make her become a better tennis player. And the reason it resonates with me is, you know, how does a year abroad in Mexico at 14 for me make me then do better in, in high school, right, uh, uh, later in English. And partly it's because when you learn Spanish, you learn all these words from Latin. And so I, I had all this vocabulary I could actually take, and I always did really well in vocabulary in English because I would 
trace it back to my Spanish vocabulary in a similar way, right? I think Ash is taking her physical skills from cricket and it rejiggled her tennis and she becomes actually eventually number one. And, and if we think about the forehand, this is my friend, Thomas Menzinger, a coach. He actually talks about rolling the ball. And I never think, I mean, if you look at Ash, you're like, what is this? What's rolling about this? But for a kid, it's rolling, right? So that's actually how they train really young kids in tennis is to roll a ball against the wall, not to actually hit it in the air which is similar to, again, the dribbling idea of just manipulating the ball, right, in, in this part of tennis. Um, and so she becomes number one. Uh, this was actually while I was talking about, I was giving these talks on, on, on language, and then now she's retired. Uh, if you might have heard, at the age of 25, again, again I think, tired of traveling, because in Australia, to get anywhere in tennis, most of the center of tennis is Europe, a little bit in the US and some in Asia, but there's not a very long season in Australia. So she can only be home about maybe a month and that, or two months out of the year um, and play tennis uh, professionally. And again, I just go back to this, the same thing, right? She even says it and they say, the coaches say there, had she continued playing tennis, she probably, we wouldn't have seen the best of Ash. Um, I guess we could ask the question now, is this retirement, if she's like Michael Jordan, right, um, or like John McEnroe, who eventually decide they want to come back again, uh, will she come back as good or, or, or not, if not better, right, um, that remains to be seen if she does actually come back. Um, but, but I really want to get back to this idea of adaptability, right, so this idea of from, this is from evolution, right, this idea that we can think of our of human sort of learning as a fixed landscape. This is from evolutionary biology, simulation of a, a species adapting to an environment. Um, I like to pull this out from my daughter's video of her backhand, which was a two-handed backhand, and then became a one-handed backhand because she followed brother and unusual because no girls hit with one-handed backhands anymore. Um, and there she is just a couple of weeks ago hitting her backhand too, two different backhands, a slice and a topspin. And so when I think about that, I think, you know, in whatever skill we pick up, we're really talking about a dynamic landscape, right? We're learning one thing and then we're switching and we're having to learn something else. And we're doing this consecutively over time as we get older. And so age matters, right? Every age is different. I always say this within the language uh, landscape, but I think within the skill building landscape, likes in soccer um, and flexibility matters. We're really good at integrating. We're really good at adapting. And I think sometimes when we try to become so specialized, we end up like the baseball players who can't hit a softball pitch. And maybe that's what we want. But as humans, there's also all this flexibility, all this give and take, right? And so I always try to keep that in mind in, in because we're so pressured, you know, and on so many levels to be really good at one thing. What about the flexibility? What about us as humans, right? I always try to keep that perspective. This is kind of the end of my language talk, which a long time ago when I was sort of thinking about how development happens from sensory motor to cognitive with the brain maturation um, in terms of language. Uh, I even talked about in terms of bilingualism, when you learn two languages, what would it look like in this kind of circular model? And the interesting thing about this is I had made these circular models before I had ever read about Teilhard de Chardin, right? So this idea that we're sort of growing, you know, you can think of it as a planet or a plant or a natural system that grows across time. You could think of that as humans, but also as our interconnectedness, um, even with our teammates, right? Or with the larger soccer um, culture or soccer connection, or as we are right now across Zoom, across many different parts of the planet. So that's, that's my whole talk. I know that I was supposed to go an hour only, but I went up over a little bit. So I hope I left enough time to, uh, to ask questions. Um, so I, I, I will stop there. Arturo, you can go as long as you want. That was, that, that's <laughs> fantastic. Um, yeah, it's just fascinating. You know, really fascinating, um, you know, how these developmental theories evolve you know how they keep building off of each other you know because looking into like um yeah i've been as a novice been fascinated uh by deliberate training you know and that concept of of you know that that's that the quality of practice right um and then tom of course is what i was fascinated with tom about was the 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 early age 
right? How important those early ages are. And you, you kind of read, you read studies too about the, the context of, you know, developing like, like, like we don't know how skill is developed, right? You could be swinging on a tree or climbing a tree and, and somehow that develops, helps you develop more than maybe practicing something else, right? Right. Um, or multi-sports, right? Or, you know, you know, even those like studies like on twins, right? That are separated at birth and one of them is encouraged to do this and the other's not. And, and this one, you know, like even like little babies, right? Like, you know, you, you put things around the room for a little baby and they're able to climb up on something on a structure they're able to climb up well they're able to then walk quicker than the one that doesn't have the structures that's right so it's like yeah it, all this stuff is really really fascinating and, and i i'm gonna definitely need to re-watch this one uh, <laughs> and we will we will post this up uh, on our on our channel so to go through but there's just so much in here to to really um to really learn from so i love it thank you and I, I know that we have a bunch of, you know, soccer coaches on here, right? And so that really it's like what I, I always try to go back to like the core of this stuff and, and you know, keeps going back to, you know, the early ages are important. The environment is important. You know, the home, uh, you know, the parents, somebody encouraging you, right? Um, and and kind of getting those core core things down early is is seems to be a big advantage. Those core skills. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, you know I can't remember um, Arturo whether you said this because uh, I've got my notes here. I've taken so many notes since we've been talking these last uh, couple of weeks as well. But I had noted here that uh, you had said uh, you don't have to teach a child too much to set them up for advanced learning. And mm -hmm. it reminds me of the video that you showed of my son, um, of those very simple kind of movements. And a lot of people don't know that, you know, when I go through my whole football starts at home presentation, I'm showing, you know, my kids when they're in the living room, um, then they're getting better. They're get That literally kind of almost went into autopilot. Once my, ch once I, what I was, I was a facilitator of just showing my kids very simple movements. And as soon as they started mastering those movements, it gave them the kind of license to explore more on their own. And so when I, when I show some of those videos of them doing really, really fast ball manipulations uh, exercises, um, people think that that's taught, but it's not. That's actually acquired. And it seems to be those layers of experience that you talk about from the little skills to the bigger skills. And that's exactly what you, your, your, the presentation was. And you're saying how the, the, skills, the skills bloom instead of really developing. I thought that's really, really interesting the way that you, you phrase that. But now looking back at those videos, they make much more sense. I understand them much better of what was happening. Whereas I could see that things were happening and, it, and my kids were getting better, but I couldn't figure out a logical way to explain it to people. So that's why I love this collaboration with 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 yourself and some of the stuff like that we we did with uh, Dr. Rady from Harvard Medical School, who's a neuropsychiatrist, and it's it just goes to show that you know when you when you you look for sometimes answers outside your your field of so, so called expertise, mm -hmm. I mean, how much we can learn from each other and from other people that are showing us to, and for some of those people that were watching. Um, Ash Barty, maybe they didn't, they didn't, they didn't know this, but Ash Barty, after she took that break, she came back into tennis. She won the French Open, she won the Australian Open, and she won Wimbledon. And then she just said, I, I'm finished at 24, 25. That's unbelievable to win that at that level. And she did it in both the singles and in the doubles as well. Yeah. So that's uh, very, very, yeah, really she's, she's a three sport athlete because it's, doubles and singles are, I mean, they're not completely different. There's lots of stuff and similar, but it really is, you know, you have double specialists and a lot of the oh, yeah, double specialists don't play singles and vice versa. So, so yeah, you're right. Actually, I, I'd forgotten to mention that she was a really good doubles player, um, which is very unusual now to have a really good doubles and singles player. They almost all specialize in one or the other. That's right. uh, they become like separate sports. Yeah. I mean, to me, I think a really fascinating part was to look at thinking about 
you know, walking and dribbling, right? If you want to use that word or ball manipulation that, that you like to call it, because, you know, it, it, um, it, it's really, it's really fascinating to, to think about the core. And I had been obsessing about the core of the serve, right? Which is this, right? Which I never learned how to throw, right? And I was just obsessed with this core, right? Of, of teaching how to throw, you know, from a really young age, because I hadn't learned how to throw that way from a really young age. And so that the idea of the ball manipulation, you know, versus, you know, what's the core of, of whatever, right? There are all these different skills you learn, and then you put them together. Um, and, and what you get, I think, is, is uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's like art, right? I mean, I think your son at three, my daughter was just like, oh my goodness. I mean, it just, and I, I like the word you use explore, right? Because there are some really interesting tennis coaches that do this funny tennis drill where they'll actually, they'll, they'll, um, they'll have a person, the kid serve anywhere on the court, and then they'll hit the ball to another corner. And it might be where they normally serve, where they don't serve. It could be off the court and they're hitting the ball all over. It's they serve and they just hit it back. And then you have to go catch it and serve immediately without thinking. And so they make them serve from the entire court, which is what something you never do. And I thought about them. I was like, that's genius because you're teaching someone to, to serve, right? But you're teaching them to serve, explore the, the court, right? Which is exactly right. You're exploring your world physically. I have to understand how I serve normally, but I have to, to understand that I have to be served from some other part. So I'm really kind of trying to map what that court is. So I have a map in my head. I'm not just learning to serve. So they're yeah. doing like two different things in that drill. And I was just kind of, I used to do that with my kids sometimes because I would never think that. You think, go to the line, serve this way, do it perfectly, you know, exactly the way you should. And that's not what really good coaches do, which is exactly what you're saying. They're exploring, right? Different yeah. kinds of environments. Which and is and it's, it, it's kind of similar to, so when uh, I started studying a lot of players who are, you know, the, the top technical players in the world, and I remember reading the interview by Neymar's father, the great Brazilian, who's, who's basically literally drunken with skill, that's how good he is, and, and reading and saying, you know, his father kind of, kind of giggling, saying, you know, people don't realize down in Brazil, kids don't fall in love with football, they fall in love with the ball, they fall in love with the ball, and that leads to falling in love with playing football. And if you think about it, I mean, that's a very kind of uh, strong statement to say, because I can't help but think that in America or in other countries where we don't have as much of a culture there, that we try to force the kids to fall in love with soccer, the ball gets in the way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it wouldn't so the, the, the importance of, of learning these skills from an early age. But if there's anybody else that wants to ask any questions, this is a great yeah, opportunity. We have a we have a good question. It's 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 kind of a a million dollar question as well. You know, but we may <laughs> not have the answers to all these. But uh, Guillermo asks, how do you apply this knowledge on day to day practices? Yeah, you know that that's a really interesting thing. I mean, I think you know again, I and, and I know um, Tom and I could have a really long conversation about you know should we use metrics? Should we use measurements? You know. I think we have to measure things, but I do think that we need to come up with a better way to understand trajectories, right? And I was talking to Paul, some kind of crazy ideas I have of developing heat maps or body movement maps, or even player interaction maps to try to understand, okay, as a player is getting older, right? What are they, how are their movements changing? And how can we try to help them in some kind of more naturalistic way, make their movements more adaptive to whatever goal, mini goal we might have? So, so I think the million dollar question is, yeah, I think if we could know what that is, that would be really helpful. But I think there's an earlier question we need to ask, which is what is skill development look like? Not on that line of, oh, we do more hours, we get better, but on like physically, what is, what can we represent physically? Can we make movies like the one I made of my daughter serving, but yeah. over longer periods of time where we can really, or maybe shorter, you know, maybe like six months, a year, two years, how is this changing? And then what kinds of activities could we use to enhance that? I don't know if we can speed it up, but we could enhance that. Um, and what are kids that seem to be advancing faster doing that others are not? I, can we enhance that as well? So I think 
the question is really a, me a measurement question, but not a measurement just like ours. It's, it's really like, can we use our video technology to really sort of leverage that and, um, and improve? Yeah. Um, but we have to measure, for, we have to measure, but not again, measurement I mean is maybe we have to, we have to catalog or understand better what's happening. That, that would be my first question. And, and that's what I would ask uh, anyone. Um, I have a pretty good idea about tennis, but um, you know, I, I, I'm very novice at soccer. That's really way out of my, my league. Just my uncle and my brother-in-law and his son and my uncle who played soccer and they dragged me into it every so And my, actually my, my, my brother-in-law's son and my own son who loved soccer and he played some when he was young. He really loved it. Um, so. But and, I, I think that that's the brilliance in collaborating is that because you actually don't know so much about soccer <laughs> that you can actually teach us things that we don't think about. And that's what happened with me with Dr. Rady from Harvard as well. When he started explaining more of the kind of the, the psychology and the connection between a parent understanding their child's need for constant attention, approval and praise, which creates that chemical electrical process, which is emotions. And we all know that when you can create an emotionally charged environment, that's where, where deep learning and long-term memory takes place, you know, and, and applying that. So just for our sport with early engagement with children, parents just understanding them even being present. When you showed that video of my boy practicing inside the house, that video would not exist in the absence of a parent. A little two, three, four, five-year-old isn't gonna go off doing these ball mastery exercises in an empty room with nobody watching. So that just in itself is a golden nugget of wisdom for parents to understand not only, okay, well, what do they practice? How do they practice? but you being present and that psychology and that, you know, you also wrote in your, in, in the book, see, I'm a little bit uh, ahead here because I read the book, right? But you, you put also, and I wrote it down, parents can share moments together. These moments will be moments that stick out with families and creating those greater connections between your child and yourself. So uh, that's why this is very applicable, at least for, for what we do with the youngsters. Um, we know that there's a lot of other coaches out here that coach with older kids. But the other reality too is, is that when it comes to skill acquisition, there is a little bit of a ceiling, you know, and people don't like to talk about it. And, but there is an open and a closed window where learning these skills is much, much easier and much quicker. And it starts with those early ages. And like we, I always say, the soccer world hasn't caught up to what science already knows. And that is, is that the skill acquisition seems to happen much, much earlier um, especially in our sport. I mean, it's interesting you say that because you could see that as a sort of negative message, right? I mean, same sure. thing with language, right? Okay, if you learn a language later, and, and you know, there's not there's nothing wrong with playing yeah. soccer recreationally or tennis recreationally. I mean, that's great. Um, but but you're also it's a message of hope, which is, you know, our windows are very open, and yeah. um, you know, it kind of opens up the question of talent, right? Of course, we always have the issue of like physically, can you handle long practices? You know, physically is your body set up? You know, of course, I have this long conversation about tennis with body type. You know, I, I think any player that's over six three in the US, pretty much between six zero, six foot, 180, and I don't know what six three would be, is the is the prime spot for tennis with a certain type of tennis. Anybody outside of that for males is not going to be world class. It's just very difficult because it's a lot of body to move around, right? So we can always talk about the physical things, right? But you know, getting really good, top hundred, you can be six ten, you can be you know five five six. I think Schwartzman, um, that's a big range to get top hundred, which is very very good, right? I mean, you can make a living off that, um, and so. You know, I think it's a message of hope, what you're saying, which is if we if we create these programs earlier, you know, Head Start did the same thing. Head Start for a long time was criticized because they said, you know, we don't know it's really helping in school. We don't know whatever. It turns out there's a study now that found that Head Start, if you start preschool earlier, you get better college completion rates. That's right. Yeah. So the effect of Head Start doesn't appear until 22. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Well, yeah, and actually here's some of the numbers. So especially if you're focusing on underserved minority communities, if you get a head start in school before getting dropped off to kindergarten, you're 20% more likely, if you don't get the head start, if you don't get the head start, 
you're 20% more likely to drop out of school. If you don't get the head start, you are, I believe it was 40% more likely to become a single parent. And then if you don't get the head start, you're 60% more likely or 70 to never attend college as well. So that you're right, there is a correlation in these, in these Head Start programs, there's no doubt about it. And I think that it, there's probably a correlation that could be done for our sport as well, because 38, uh, the Aspen uh, Institute of Sport did a study a few years back and found that 38.5% of the kids in America who play soccer quit by the age of seven, and another 50% quit by the age of 10. And they lip all of the reasons why they point the rifles at the coaches and they're not good enough. There's more coaches education. They point the rifles at the parents. And I, there's something to that. But I believe the reality is, is that most of these kids never learned the basic building blocks to succeed. So they fall out of love with the game or they never fell in love with the game. And when you get a little bit older, that's when self-awareness kicks in and you start realizing, well, I'm not really that good, am I? I got to come practice more and I'm sitting on the bench. So there's lots of lots of things I think when you, when you don't get those building blocks, um, it's hard to 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 retain people in any sport. Yeah, I mean, I, I I think the same happens in tennis too. I can see you know now after having all the mistakes I made in my game and then talking to my uncle and sort of with my youngest daughter, I can see that there's a lot of stuff that had to be in place, including her one-handed backhand, which no woman really hits, no girl hits with one-handed backhands. Even the boys don't anymore. And so many people told me, don't do that. And she asked me, she said at 11, you know, I feels funny with two hands. Can I just switch to one? And my son plays with one, I play with one. And I just let her because that's what she asked me. She asked yeah. me to do that. Why am I going to go against her? What she tells me, she told me three, four years later, why'd you let me do that? Because everybody hits with two and everybody would say, you'd be so much better if you hit with two hands. Her, you know, it's coming along. It, it's taking longer. She's not as strong as a woman, you know, as a girl, it's harder to get that strength. Uh, boys have more strength. My son developed it earlier, but it's becoming quite good. And she chose that. And that's her path. Why am I going to tell her to not follow a path? You know, if she doesn't end up being like whatever, you know, tennis player she could be, that was what she chose. And so I, I understand what you're saying. It's, it's really easy to fall out of love, but I always told her, you know, that's what you want to do. And she took some agents. She made some decisions about what she wanted to do. And I let her do that. And I think, you know, sometimes it's hard yeah. for, for kids because they feel like so much of what they do is told to them and dictated to them in school or in soccer or in sports. Um, well, it's like I think Paul knows this story too. When the head coach of uh, Chelsea, the German Suchel, he uh, he tells the story about when he was at a conference and the coaches from Barcelona, when I believe it was Iniesta that came in, and they said he went to all the coaches, and he said, "Please don't try to change anything. Just take care of him. Just let him play. Just let him do his thing." Yeah. And sometimes we do a little bit too much over coaching, yeah. um, but you know. Again, I, I think that, you know, when, when kids have mastered the core skills, regardless of what the sport is, obviously it's, it's much easier to work with those players, but it's the players that don't. You know, we're so obsessed with elite training all over the world, but the reality is, is that regardless of whatever elite structures you put in place, it's always going to be dependent upon the quality of those kids that are coming up, and a majority of them can't take advantage of all this great elite training because they're just not good enough. You know, so yeah. maybe well, some more questions if there's any, or let's see here. This has been great, Arturo. Yeah. Really, really fantastic. Um, and you've got um, an academy here that uh, will be happy to collaborate um, on, on learning more about the emergence of skill and, and, uh, be guinea pigs and if we need to try some things here. Yeah, I mean, I'm just very, like like Tom said, because I don't know anything, I'm just curious to see, you know, how how I would see, I sort of saw some in, in the video of his kids, right, from, or his son, right, from really young with one foot, which I kind of noticed, then with two feet, and then in a game, right, and sort of thinking about how does the system get built out Yep. In, a, in a way that I think in, it's, it's ironic, right, that, that, in, that in sport or maybe in music, 
um, you know, the non-extracurriculars, you have all this data, right, on sort of development across long periods of time where, where you know, you think about these skills sort of developing over time in a way that schools kind of don't, right, um, in, in some ways. And so I'm really curious to see what does that system look like? How does it develop? Um, you know, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled. I, I, I kept pinching myself because I didn't think you know, I didn't think one that Tom would would even answer, um, you know, my email and I was thrilled that he did and then that we met is great. So I, I, I really look forward to, to, to learning, you know, I guess more about soccer. Hey, we can help with that. Before. We can help with that for sure. Yeah. Um, I was gonna say that might be a good note, huh? Because Paul and I will keep you busy, don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> thanks again, Arturo. Um, Tom, thanks for uh, staying up Tokyo time. Yeah, anytime. Awesome man. as usual. Love it. And uh, thanks yeah. everyone for joining us today. We'll, we will definitely, we have this recorded and we'll definitely get it uploaded onto the site. Definitely worth a, a share and share it with, uh, share it with your fellow coaches as well that are out there. This is really, really an awesome one. Good stuff. Yeah. Okay. All right, gentlemen, well, it's off the bed for me and we'll, uh, we'll talk again soon. Okay. Take care. See you guys. Bye, guys. Thanks a lot. I appreciate Bye. it. Bye-bye. Thank you. Yeah. Bye-bye.